Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at H&M.com. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Do your thing however you cha-ching with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 23. Food Heals Podcast, episode 114. Even on my two-week cleanse that's pretty strict and people have pretty big results with, you can still eat a piece of cheesecake every day. So, you know. Oh, heck what? yeah. How do I Wait join? a minute. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to actually start using their $39.99 a month gym membership. If you experience any of these symptoms, Snapchat your trainer immediately. All right. Welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. And I'm Susie Hardy. Today, we're speaking with Tess Chalice. She's a wellness coach, a chef, an author, and a recipe developer. You know, I'm starting to feel like a broken record, but Tess, like oh so many of our guests who teach about healthy food, struggled herself with health issues from childhood. You're not a broken record. I think you're just onto something. You're, you're seeing a pattern here. <laughs> I, I think you're right. Makes sense, though. Yeah. Why would you really delve into the subject of healthy food and what that means to you if you didn't have to? You know, people don't change until they really need to. And I see that a lot with our guests on our show and people in general that I meet in life. But with food, it is becoming more and more obvious that we are what we eat. We are absolutely. Back to Tess. (laughs) Back to Tess. Yes. So Tess was so sickly as a child that she could no longer take any antibiotics because she became resistant to all of them. She continued to struggle with health issues until 1991 when she became vegan. She felt better for a while, but then became obsessive about food and wound up an obese vegan. And there's a lot of people that talk about this. It's the perfectionism. It's trying to do everything right. And, you know, I would love to hear how she got over that. So this led Tess to make some big changes. She developed a color-coded system, which we're really excited to get into that, to help herself. And now she helps others using the color-coded system to lose weight and just feel better all around. This system of joyful weight loss is what she shares in her cookbooks and her Be Radiant group. Our sponsor today is the Global Healing Center. I don't think Food Heals Nation has ever heard of them, have they? No, never. Not by us. No, 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 no. (laughs) Global Healing Center was founded by Dr. Group, who is just such an amazing guy. And he promotes the holistic way of life that we promote. And so all their products, like whenever I need something, I just go and I see if Global Healing Center has it because I know if they carry it, that it's trusted. Like I get all my digestive enzymes from them. Everyone knows I get the parfait massage from them. Everyone knows I love the aqua spirit refreshing spray. (laughs) Yes, exactly. I just got their NutriCool. It's uh, something you rub on aches and pains. So like I've been doing this intense Pilates lately. So the NutriCool is like what you rub when you're really sore. So that's been great. And I just trust their brand more than most other supplement companies. Love their products. Yeah. So you can get 20% off any Global Healing Center product by going to globalhealingcenter.com and using the coupon code Food Heals. Next up, our interview with Tess. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. Today we're here with Tess Chalice, who for the last 20 years has worked as a wellness coach, a chef, and a writer. She's written five books to help you live your healthiest life. After struggling with weight and health as a kid, it took her many years to figure out how to heal her body and her obsessive nature over food. Tess went from eating everything, she is a foodie, to being very restrictive and punishing herself over those food choices. 
But once she figured out how to eat for her own health, she wanted to help others do the same, and that is what she does today. She also helps develop food recipes for healthy companies, one being Ziggy Marley's Organics. Welcome, Tess. Thank you. So great to be on your show, you guys. We're so glad to have you. And I love the bio on your website because it really tells your story. And that's what Susie and I are all about is hearing people's stories of how they got to be where they are today. So let's just start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your childhood and, and what you experienced as a child being sick? Yeah. Yeah. I love that you read that. So I grew up on, for the most part, a standard American diet. And you know, the woman who raised me, my grandma was a nurse, you know, mm -hmm. and so like many others in the medical profession had no nutritional training Sure, and never connected the fact. And I, of course, don't blame her for this, but, you know, we just never connected the fact that I was chronically ill all the time with what I was eating. So I was constantly getting headaches. I was always sick. A friend of mine that I was friends with in grade school told me a few years ago that she remembers me never being able to play with her at recess because I was always out sick. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I was like, wow, that's amazing. You remember that. And then I was sick with strep throat so many times that I became immune to every antibiotic on the market. Wow. Yeah. And I just was like always, always at the doctor's office and nobody had solutions. And like so many people, and this is why I get so passionate about this subject is because, you know, like so many people in our country, I just assumed that a state of disease and unhealth, unhealthy living was normal. And it was normal to always feel crappy. And it was normal to always be sick. And that was just how light, you know, that's just how life is. And I just sort of accepted that as a fact. Yeah, so, I did yeah. the same thing. And it's so sad, because now, mm -hmm. like your website is all about, we can live in radiance, but we have to learn how we have to learn those tips and tricks and tools. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. It's such an amazing shift and revelation when you realize that you actually, not only can you live healthy and, and you don't have to be sick and suffer, but you can actually enjoy life more in the process and enjoy food more. So that is why I get really jazzed about this stuff is because we don't have to, we don't even have to feel deprived really. We yeah. can we can have everything. Yeah. So you were having all this strep throat and then what happened next? So that just went on and on and on and on and on. And then when I got to college at the age of, I'd say maybe I was 19 or so, I became a vegetarian and that seemed to help with certain things. I started to have more energy. Um, one Another issue I didn't mention was the fact that I had so little energy all the time. I remember being in high school and after lunch, I remember I had English after lunch and I remember feeling like my head was a brick and it was like hard to hold my head up wow. because I was so tired. And now I sometimes feel tired before I eat. And then when I eat, I actually feel energized. <laughs> that's how it should be. We should, you know, food is good energy. It shouldn't make us tired. So, so the, the becoming a vegetarian helped me to have more energy. However, I still had pretty bad acne. It was, it was kind of like the strep throat where the, where the dermatologist said, Hey, this is just, you just have bad skin. This this is just genetic and you just have bad skin. Mm -hmm. And so I just accepted that as a fact. And, you know, as a young girl, that doesn't feel good to feel like you're not attractive because you have a horrible skin. Absolutely so, not. No, it was so embarrassing. I just remember just feeling awful about that. Just mm -hmm. ugh, it was horrible. So I became a vegan when I was around 20 and I didn't even do it with a thought in mind of that it would change any of my, you know, I didn't think it would change anything as far as my health. I did it only because I wanted to live in accordance with my principles because I had learned about animal agriculture and I didn't, and I didn't want to, you know, I just didn't want to take part in that anymore. So I became a vegan mm -hmm. and then I, within about two weeks, my skin cleared up, which I remember looking in the mirror and just being blown away by the fact that my skin looked so much better. And I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday looking in the mirror and going, is this right? Yeah. Like, yep. how can this be? How can this be? And I started having more energy. I had been anemic before that. The mm -hmm. irony is people think that you're 
anemic if you're vegan. Actually, my iron went way up. Me too. And Same thing okay. happened. Yeah, I was oh, anemic so- as in high school. I was anemic. I used to faint. I would pass out in soccer. I passed out at the mall. All this stuff. Got diagnosed with anemia. They're like, here, take these iron pills, which never iron. really did anything. And then now as an adult living this plant-based healthy lifestyle, I have no iron deficiency. I love that. Yeah. And I'm just going to say one, I'm going to sidetrack one other cool thing about iron. Yeah. I, again, I've been, you know, I've been vegan for like 25 years. I was pregnant as a vegan. Mm. My daughter is now 13. She is also has been vegan all her life. It's her choice. She loves it. That's amazing. As, yeah. Thank you. She's wonderful. So I was pregnant and I, at the time, you know, I thought about, Hey, I guess, you know, like everybody you get you know, kind of pressured by the doctors. Okay. You need to start getting on, you know, pills and da, 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 da. And my husband at the time said, you know what? You're really healthy. You don't need pills. Just we, you know, you're going to get your checkup every two weeks. The midwives check you for all of your levels. So I didn't do prenatals Mm -hmm. and I, my levels on everything were great actually up until one point. And I had been eating kind of a lot of vegan junk food for a couple of weeks <laughs> and it caught up to me and I went in and they said, you know, your iron has dropped. You're now at the low end of normal. If you get any lower, you're going to be low. Mm-hmm. And so they said, you know, we need to put you on pills. And I thought, you know, this would be kind of cool just to see what food will do. Mm-hmm. And so for the next two weeks, I just ate more beans and I ate more greens and I came back and they were like, wow, what kind of pills? Those, those are really good pills. And I, said, <laughs> I said, actually, I did not take a pill. I just ate a little better. I ate, I didn't, I still was vegan. I just ate more greens and beans. And so I just love telling that because I think it's, it's a good example of the fact that we get so much nutrients, so many of our nutrients from food. Mm-hmm. We don't need in my opinion, we just don't need pills. I feel like, you know, a really healthy plant-based diet is so sufficient, not only for your own body, but even if you're growing another person inside of you. So, you know, in my, that was my experience. I remember um, one of my first experiences with a nutritionist was her giving me a huge box of pills that I was supposed to be taking. And I just, at first I was like, oh, this is going to heal me. And all I, all it did was make me realize this is completely unsustainable and I have to get these vitamins from food. You know, wow. it was just, wow. you can't take 50 supplements a day. You got to get them from food. And of course, supplement where you need to, but you can get it all from the plants. And, I and the actually food. have to pipe in here, ladies. I actually disagree. I think that there can be gaps. I think that if you, I personally think that if you are eating right from the farm to table, that if things are picked at the peak of freshness and they're organic and pesticide-free in the way that things should be, yes, that would be ideal. But I think that there's a – I think a lot of people would be a little bit deficient if they are not doing – you know, getting their their beans and greens, as Tess just said – right away because you lose nutrient value. No, I agree. I think it's just more the fact of how many pills do we really need and what are being prescribed to us that we can get from food is the point. I totally agree that sometimes, of course, got to supplement when you need to. Absolutely. I think it's, yeah. And I think it depends on the person, you know, I know that there are people and there's, there's definitely disagreements there. And I do think it's important to, to show that it's not a vegan issue. It's just a human eating food issue. Yeah. For and sure. So, you know, I don't think I, I, I really want to disconnect people from thinking, well, if you're vegan, you need to supplement. And that's why I get hot on the topic. <laughs> so, you know, and I do have my levels tested occasionally and even like B12 and iron and calcium and protein and all of the things people think you're supposed to be deficient in. And I personally haven't supplemented and am high in all of those things, but I know that there are people who aren't. And so I think it comes down to each individual, but I do believe that it's possible to get our nutrients. And of course, eating organic and whole foods and eating a, you know, healthy diet and, and not eating, you know, eating as minimal amount of junk as you can. What do you think about the way that even, even things that we are told that are quote unquote organic, I have read that GMOs have now found their way into so many of our food sources. Do you think that has an effect on the the nutritional value of our produce? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, and I I think that it comes down to we do our you have to do your best. Because at this point, if unless like you said, Susie, unless you're like growing your own food in your backyard, and it's organic, and you just bring it in, you know, it's like you, you can't we can't be perfect. But we just do our best. And so for me, that means 
I buy organic. Yes, if I can go to a farmer's market and get something that was just picked and it's like locally grown, that's amazing. But we don't always have that ability. So yeah, it affects it. So definitely, I mean, I definitely avoid GMOs whenever possible. But, you know, you just, I think we do our best. We, right, I, we don't have right. to be perfect, but yeah. yeah. All right. So your skin cleared up, you went vegan. And then what were you experiencing after that? Tell us what happened. Yeah. So my skin cleared up. That was the first thing I noticed. Oh, the other thing I noticed was I remember sitting there looking at my nails going, why are my nails stronger now? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not drinking milk anymore. Cow's milk. Mm -hmm. Why are my nails stronger? So I noticed my nails got stronger. I thought that was really interesting. And I never again got strep throat. And I had been getting it literally every few months. I did it. Know. I did too as a wow. child. I got it every single year on my birthday in December without oh, no. fail. Without wow. fail when oh, I was in high school. A lot. And then I would get it a few months later, sometimes a few months before, but it would be twice a year consistently. And no, we never thought about dairy. We never thought about diet. Yeah. Like there was no, yeah. it was antibiotics after antibiotics. Wow. So we've had some similarities. And I totally. remember it being, I mean, don't you remember it just being awful? Like strep Ugh. throat just felt so awful. It was the worst. I would be knocked out for days on my couch. And I remember it was always during the holidays and I was always missing oh, holiday no. parties. <laughs> oh, that's awful. That's so sad. Yeah, I don't. Rem yeah, I don't remember. Somehow I avoided it during the holidays. Really? I don't remember it during the holidays, but I just I had it all the time. Yeah. And Oh my gosh, but I haven't ever had it since going vegan and my daughter has never once had it. Wow. And I just think that's interesting because she's, you know, she's been vegan. And so I do, I do think there's a connection there. And so I never got, you know, and I just, I stopped having, you know, I stopped being sick all the time. I started just sort of experiencing much more consistent health and my, you know, again, my iron went up and I just, I had more energy. And so then at that point, that was actually what motivated me to learn how to cook because then I'm standing there going, well, I believe in this ethically. And obviously this is, you know, I can't go back now mm -hmm. because my gosh, I can't go back to strep throat and acne and all that, but I don't like the food. So now what do I do? Mm -hmm. Because that was really frustrating because I have always really liked food, big time foodie. So that was hard because at first I got really frustrated with the cookbooks I was using because I was, you know, this poor college student and I'm spending my money on, on groceries and then I'm making these recipes that don't turn out. And I'm like, I'm dying just to eat good food again. Mm -hmm. So I just really had to get to town and learn how to make make it a delicious food choice as well as one that worked for me in other ways. Absolutely. And so how did you go about doing that? Oh my gosh. It was a lot of failure. The first year I made a lot of really crappy food. Like I said, in my newest cookbook, Food Love, I talk a little bit about that time and, you know, things I learned, you don't put vanilla soy milk in mashed potatoes. Um, <laughs> oh. That's one that sticks out in my mind. And I'd be like, I'd make these dishes and I was just clueless. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I would just make these recipes and they would turn out horribly. I remember one time I blended up some of the rubber spatula into a salad dressing. You know, so I just, I don't even, I think I just kept experimenting and kept experimenting. And I finally started getting a few recipes that I liked. And then I just got, I just got busy. I just kept you know, I, I kept trying to duplicate tastes that I had, you know, you know, let's say I had eaten in a Vietnamese restaurant. I, you know, I duplicated those fresh rolls and I, I developed the skill of being able to duplicate flavors of things that I had liked and just over, a, you know, a lot of failure, a lot of trial and error finally got to a point where I could enjoy the diet, you know, enjoy the lifestyle as much as I had in the past. And it got to the point where I enjoyed it more. And I got, and I, I remember again, you know, this moment of realization where I was like, wow, I actually, I actually have a more expanded and interesting and delicious and flavorful diet than I ever did before going vegan. And it no longer feels limited. It now feels infinitely expansive. Mm. And that was a really cool turning point. And was that after, because we did read also in your bio about how for a little while you were eating the, was this after you were eating the vegan junk food and you gained weight? 
It was actually before that. Ah. So, th- so what happened for me was I started to really develop the recipes. And then after a couple of years, I well, maybe, I don't even know, maybe like it was more like two, two or three years after that. I, I just got into this mode. And as women, maybe you can relate of trying to all of a sudden, I just went into this weird mode of body perfection. Mm-hmm. And I'm not good enough. I'm looking at these women in magazines or whatever, and they're so skinny and I, and I have to be perfect. And, and I'm reading these books about how you can't eat any fat and how you can't eat any oil and nuts and seeds are bad. And so now I just, I just went into this kind of disordered eating mode of having to be perfect and, and not allowing myself to, to enjoy salads with tahini dressing anymore or Mm -hmm. spring rolls with peanut sauce anymore. And, you know, things, tofu and things that I really, really liked, I sort of said, okay, these foods are now bad. Mm -hmm. I can never, I can never eat an onion ring again because it's bad because it's fried. And so for me that created disordered eating where I would go from one extreme. And this is, I do a lot of coaching on this subject and I'm get very passionate about it because I work with, a, there are so many women that go through this process, in, especially in the vegan community, because there are a lot of people out there promoting a lot of fear-based eating programs. Absolutely. Yeah. So good. I'm glad you agree. Yeah, it drives me a little crazy. Some of the <laughs> things people have sent me, you know, they're, they're in eating disorder clinics and these programs have put them into eating disorder clinics. And I've gotten several emails from women like that. Wow. And yeah, and it's just, it's, I get a little hot about it and I don't want to mention names, but you know, there's people, very, very prominent people that are not kind, that have said really insulting things to women, mm. to their faces about, you know, that they need to lose weight and that they're not good enough. And, you know, so I really work on that with clients and with women. And so that was my, and it was my experience. It was yeah. my experience because I no longer was happy at my healthy weight, the weight that I'm at now, which I feel great at now. But at that point, it wasn't it was something that I just struggled with and went from extreme to extreme. And this is what I see with the women I work with is they're either binging or they're restricting. Yes. Right. So it's either, Oh, I'm eating so perfectly. I'm eating lima beans and salad with vinegar on it. I'm not eating a drop of oil and I'm doing this for however long. And then, Oh my God, I cannot do this anymore. And I'm eating nothing but junk. And that's what I did. (laughs) I would go for days eating like, quote unquote, the perfect diet. And then I would see an onion ring and I would just go on a bender and just eat (laughs) onion ring. I feel you. I love onion rings myself. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, and now I can eat an onion ring and it doesn't even matter because I'm not binging on them. But so Tess, let me ask you a question. Where do you stand now in terms of oil for yourself and your clients? Uh, So yeah, so as you know, as a formerly obese vegan, for many years I was obese and I was eating a lot of fats. I'm not someone that can just eat infinite amounts of fat because it will put on weight. It will make me put on weight. However, I don't restrict completely because then it just makes me want to binge. So I'm I have found a place that works for me where I eat minimal fat, but I do use oil. You know, I will use oil in my cooking. I just won't pour a big bunch of oil in a pan and fry something up, but I will put maybe a teaspoon of oil and saute. And then to me, it has a lot of flavor and I'm not, I find that I'm just more satisfied if I eat food that has a full flavor and then I'm not feeling like I need to keep eating in order to get that savory satisfaction. And you developed a color-coded system. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I feel like everything you've been saying, that's been me in so many different points in my life, like binging and restricting and going, this is bad. No, this is bad. No, this week, this is bad. And so I've done a lot of work to get over that. And how did you develop your system that works for yourself that I think you also teach to clients? I do. I use the color coded system to cl- with clients and also in my books, my all my recipes are color coded. Yeah, I developed the system because of kind of what I said, you know, I, I felt like, for me, the big turning point, the huge light bulb going off was when I realized that 
okay, I've, this is, I've been doing this for eight years. I'm now clinically obese. This isn't working. Mm -hmm. It is just not working for me to vilify all of the foods that I'm really just eating all the time in excess anyway. So, you know, and I just, I see this all the time with women. Well, I can't eat that. And then of course that's what they're eating. Right. So, you know, that's (laughs) what I was doing. There was no reality to what I was saying that I was doing because I was doing it sometimes and then binging. So I finally realized that, okay, I can eat anything that I want as long as I do it in balance and in moderation. So the green foods are those that, you know, at the same time, you know, allowing myself to eat everything I want doesn't mean that I just go on, you know, and I just eat chocolate cake all day because that doesn't work either. So, so really the simple, simple thing that is so powerful is balance. So I developed a system where I said, okay, green foods, you can eat as much as you like. They're very low in fat, very high in nutrients. They're filling, you know, like a bean dish or a salad or quinoa or whatever. And it's just a whole food plant-based dish that is really, you get a lot out of it for the calories. Okay. So that's what you base your diet on. And then the blue foods, you know, on the cover of my newest cookbook, there's a strawberry chocolate cheesecake that is, it's not a junky cheesecake, but it's pretty high in fat. It's a raw, mostly a raw cheesecake. So it's still really high in nutrients, but it's really rich. So that's a blue food. And so those are things we eat more in moderation, but we don't just vilify and say, well, I can never eat that. How many and cheesecakes then, can I eat per week? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say one. Oh per man. Week. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean a piece a day, even on my even on my two week cleanse that's pretty strict and people have pretty pretty big results with, you can still eat a piece of cheesecake every day. So, you know, oh, heck what? Yeah. how do I join? wait a minute? Wait a minute. <laughs> two week right? cleanse with raw cheesecake every day? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I need to sign yeah, up. I need, I need to find out how to do that cleanse at the end. <laughs> right? We're gonna, we want links. We want links, Tess. <laughs> yeah, it's my second cookbook. It's it's a two week. It's called the Two Week Wellness Solution, and it it works. I mean, you know, yeah, you're eating mostly green food, but you can have a serving of a blue food every day, is and it, you still is have that a hard results. dish to make? Because when cheesecake? I uh, the raw cheesecake, yeah, yeah, uh, no, you just have to have a food processor. You don't need to like be soaking and sprouting and nope. dehydrating nope. and okay. Oh no, no. We're getting nope. this recipe before the podcast is over, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and I and I gosh, I was traveling recently and I made it for some family and they're not vegan and they taste it and they were like they were just standing there like dumbfounded. Like I can't believe this is this delicious. Like mm. oh, they were like this is they both said it was the best cheesecake they'd ever had in their lives. And they couldn't believe it was healthy. They were like, I can't believe I don't have to feel guilty about eating this. The few times that I've done like raw food cleanses from a place that prepares them in Santa Monica, because I know that it can raw food can be very complicated to create yeah. really well. Oh, yeah. Um, but they were always encouraging, you know, their desserts, which were fairly healthy. You know, they said, eat our... I, I don't know what it was, but it was like a peach cheese. It wasn't a cheesecake, but it was like that. It was creamy and it had peaches. And it was like, they're like, have this for breakfast. I was yeah. in heaven. It was amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And oh, and I know you can actually, you can be pretty complex with, with raw food. I really am more about full flavor. So when I create dishes, I'm thinking ultimate, you know, nutrients, ultimate flavor, you know, I want everything to have a really full flavored, um, you know, so that you feel really satisfied when you eat it. And then I just want it to be simple. So I don't do a lot of the, I don't do a lot of the complex, you know, some of the stuff I do is complex, but I, I like to be simple with my cooking for the most part. So I need the simplicity. Yeah. Those are the kind of cookbooks that resonate with me, like simpler ingredients, simple to create because otherwise I mess it up. <laughs> yeah. It just gets to be, and it's just like, who has time for that? Yeah, exactly. Oh so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and then the final color code is purple, which those are the things that, you know, maybe avoid for the most part, but it's, it's, I don't want to vilify food because I just, know how psychologic and I know what happens in people's psyches when they say oh I can never eat and you know for me it was onion rings oh I can never eat onion rings again well now onion rings to me are a purple food Mm -hmm. because it's just vegan junk food and so you just eat those rarely that's like if you're at a party or something fine but you're not going to make them in your home right exactly I don't really keep anything that's you know, considered purple in my house. I know maybe for my daughter, she likes to have certain things that she's 13 and she can eat them. And I just have no desire to put that in my body at this point. But yeah, so it's just, it's just very kind of treats for occasional 
purposes. Awesome. Okay, so the three colors are blue, purple, and green. Green. And yeah. so those are the only colors. So it's basically three levels. Like eat all you want, keep in moderation, and kind of avoid. Yeah. Avoid for the most part, but but not a big deal to eat once in a while. That's yeah. A, that's a good thing. And I think that is so Thank important you. because anytime we ever say you can't ever have this again, yeah. just like <laughs> w- just like the child in yeah. us, just like kids yeah. react, oh, I can't have that. Yes, I can. And then you oh, create absolutely. this complete imbalance in terms of your relationship with food. And you know, I actually had a somewhat some some kind of subconscious eating disorder when I was in sixth grade. It was completely subconscious. It was related more to emotional stuff than, say, restricting or telling myself stuff is bad and stuff was good. But I've seen friends go through that where actually some of my vegetarian friends in college where they would say, oh, yeah, I can't have this and I can't have that. But then they would binge on the other stuff that they said was okay and they did wind up gaining weight and weren't healthy in the end. Exactly. Exactly. I completely agree. Yeah. You know, and that's something I sometimes say when I give talks is I say, if I tell all of you that you can never have chocolate again – then what are you going to eat tonight? And everybody says, well, chocolate, of course. That's all you know, I can think because, about. <laughs> yeah, that's all I can think about because tomorrow I'm going to be perfect and never eat chocolate again. But today i got to get all that chocolate out of the way. And so that's, you know, that's what I did for eight years is, well, tomorrow I'll be perfect. And today I've already screwed up. So I'm just going to eat all the crap, get it out of my system. And of course, that's just a big fat lie. So, <laughs> you know, you just nobody does that. Nobody just goes, OK, I'm going to be perfect tomorrow. And then they are. So, no. so let's talk about, you said that you had a vegan pregnancy and you had midwives. I would love to hear about your birthing experience. And I know uh-huh. that this gets controversial, but we love talking about this stuff. We just had a really amazing fertility expert on who was blowing our minds with not only what to eat and what not to eat, but also like how much the plastics can affect a growing womb and, and just drinking out of a coffee cup, you know, you don't know what you're putting in your body and just things like that. So I would love to talk to you a little bit about what your pregnancy was like. Yeah. So my pregnancy, this is a fun topic. I don't usually get asked about this. is cool. <laughs> yeah. So I had a great pregnancy. It was, you know, I felt pretty healthy. It was a good exercise in listening to my body. I'm a big advocate of, you know, just tuning in and listening to your body. And so my body would say, hey, I really like raspberries. I want to eat all of the raspberries in the world today. And so I just ate a lot of, I don't know why, just ate a lot of raspberries. (laughs) Uh, I didn't eat, for some reason, I had this crazy aversion to brown rice. And it's funny because my daughter doesn't like brown rice. (laughs) She she was telling you from inside the womb. She's like, I know it's been, it was it used to be a little struggle because I was like, honey, white rice is, you know, come on, brown rice. And she'd be like, I don't like it. <laughs> so I finally just gave in and I'm like, okay, fine. You can just eat white rice all the time. So it was just funny to have like food aversions and things like that. So I was mostly pretty healthy. I felt so good when I was six months pregnant and it was winter that I had, and I had friends visiting in town that I took them on this like five hour back country excursion in the snow on snowshoes. <laughs> I just felt so good. And I'm like, I want to show you this trail and I want to show you this iced up waterfall and blah, blah, blah. And it was way too much. And I pulled a muscle in my stomach and was like barely mobile the, the last months because I just way overdid it. I, I felt a little too good and got a little. So I, I would suggest not getting cocky. Um, <laughs> But so that was that was the only bad thing. And then by the after I had the baby, I was fine. It was just one of those things. And I have to ask, how much did she weigh at birth? She weighed, gosh, you know, I should know this as a mom. It was <laughs> you it should was about the same as I weighed. <laughs> I know, right? Well, I it's been it's I been went, it's been thirteen years. Every every friend that yeah. I have as a newborn, they're like, they were, you know, right. seven oh, pounds yeah. and sixteen point two ounces. Right. <laughs> right. I can tell you everything about her now at thirteen, but no. I think it was I think I wanna say she was six pounds thirteen ounces. I think that's Okay, what so she was. that and I have Allison nor I have had children yet. But I have seen so many friends have these big, big babies that are actually that are meat eaters or still on dairy and and thinking that – and I have had some friends that are vegans that had babies and they had what I would consider doable – birth weights to have a yeah. natural childbirth. And I don't know if you had a natural t- – did you have a natural childbirth or did you have a C-section? I, okay. Well, we're girls here. If you want to hear – do you really want to hear what happened? Yeah. yeah. We love hearing these stories. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this – you can take away – I have a it's, a – it's kind of not a pleasant story. I won't get too gross. It's not a pleasant story, but you will take away that you should listen to your own inner wisdom. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
So, and that's what I got out of it. So what happened was I hadn't been sleeping. It was just, it's under the circum, it was just weird circumstances the week before she was born and I hadn't been sleeping. I was really tired and I started feeling like I was going into labor. So we went to the hospital. The midwife said, no, you're not in labor. Go home. And at what, uh, where were you in terms of your pregnancy? Were you close to term or? I was like, yeah, I was like right there. I was right there. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I was at like nine months, whatever. Yeah, I was right there. So the next morning, I still felt like I was in labor. My husband at the time came in and he's like, we're going to the hospital. You're in labor. And I was like, well, she's not going to believe me. She just thinks I'm making it up. And he's like, no, we're going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. You're in labor. So we go in. And I'm just kind of moaning and I'm feeling like I'm in labor. And she says, no, you're not in labor. But we'll we'll go ahead and give you a room. And so they, they put me in a room. Is this because you yeah. weren't dilated? Like, why was she saying I no? Was, I guess I was just kind of calm and I was only at three centimeters. Okay. And she just didn't believe I was in labor. And I, and so here's the funny thing is I remember, and for those that know this term, it's called transition. And it's when I, you know, when I read in the books, I had known from reading that transition was considered the hardest part of labor. Okay. It's the it's the most intense, difficult part of labor is called transition. Okay. So here I am. Now I know I was in transition. I actually threw up. I was it was so intense and the midwife looks at me and she says, "If you can't handle this, you better you, she's like, you better buck up because you're not going to be able to handle actual labor." Oh, oh that's very God. supportive. <laughs> yeah. So, she, way to go. My husband, <laughs> I know. And so my husband at the time is telling me, you know, she's out there telling all the nurses that you're not in labor and, you know, he's like, "I believe you, but she does not believe you're in labor." And so she's telling me, she's telling me that I'm basically a wuss, right? Because if I can't handle this, I better just buckle up and because I can't handle actual labor. So oh, anyway, God. So anyway, I'm like, I, I'm like, I can't take any more. I wanted to do a natural birth, but I said, you got to give me something. Yeah. Like, I'm, a, I'm obviously a wuss. I can't handle childbirth. So they gave me a test dose of an epidural and I went, I took the test dose. I went into the bathroom and I just felt like I was in labor and I came out and I said, can you just please check me? I really feel like I'm in labor. So they checked me again and they were like, oh, the baby's coming out. So- <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And, then, and every time I see that midwife at the store or wherever, she just kind of has the sheepish look on her face. I mean, I think she felt really bad about it. But you know, I I feel like, and she kept telling me, "Well, I've been doing this twenty years. This is your first baby. You don't know what you're talking." Why about. would oh they? My give, god. Why would they give you a test dose if you weren't in labor? Because I just was like, give me some drugs. I mean, and they I'm were not like this person. I'm like, give me drugs. I cannot handle another minute of this intensity. Yeah. So they just gave me something to take the edge off my pain, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is that people will tell you all the time. And this relates back to food, you guys, because people, doctors will tell you, oh, I know this because I'm a doctor. I know everything. You know, I know about your health. And it's like we stop believing our inner wisdom. We stop believing our gut that actually is so deeply wise and knows Yeah. And I really, that was a really strong thing. That was a really, that was a moment that really defined, okay, I need to be more trusting of my own wisdom. Absolutely. You know, here's this person. Well, I've been doing this 20 years. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. But I did. I did. You totally did. Yeah, I did know. The whole time I knew I was just being told, well, you're not, you know, you're not. So, and it's so nice to hear that your husband was like, I believe you. I'm with you. Yeah, like, yeah. that's amazing. Because yeah. sometimes yeah. the husband might yeah. think, oh, obviously, like, this woman's right. And my wife is just, you know, not sure what's going on because they don't know yeah. either. So the fact that no. he trusted you and was like, yeah. I trust your gut. Like, let's do something is, is really great. And I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, what separates us from doctors? What's What separates the lay person from doctors? Well, they're more educated. They've read a lot more. They've taken yes. tests. But they've yes. read a lot more. That's pretty much it. And, and are more up to date on latest science. That's it. So if yeah. you are an outlier and you happen to fall out of their statistical category of which whatever you're dealing with, say, labor looks like this mm-hmm. and Tess is kind of outside of that. So she can't be in labor. But you were. Yes. I was totally in labor. The baby was literally coming out like they saw hair. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, you're not in labor. You've got another week. And the, like the literally the baby is coming out of me. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. So it's just a good lesson. It's a good reminder, especially as women. Yeah. We get punked. We, yeah, we, we, we do. stopped. You know, we doubt ourselves way too much. Sure. 
So, well, it can be it can be yeah. very challenging because if you're up against, especially especially with doctors and health stuff, where it can be very scary and they can give you a lot of statistics about what can go wrong or yes. the side effects yes. or blah 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 or you know they, they it's a lot of fear. Yeah, and instead of educating yes. you and and I think there seems to be. You guys correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, but I think there seems to be a more of a transition towards doctors working with you as a patient versus just being the authoritarian voice and telling you what you should do. But I, but that's still in, that's still in play. I mean, that's still there. I hope so. I hope so. Cause that's, you know, we need that. All right, guys, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with Tess to teach us about sprouting. And she's got some really exciting tips for us. Today's show is sponsored by the Global Healing Center. You know them. We talk about them all the time. You know that all their products are organic, are free of GMOs, use no toxic ingredients, are eco-friendly. And you know that I'm obsessed with their Parfait Visage. And I'm obsessed with their Aqua Spirit Refreshing Spray. And you know we scored a discount code for you to get 20% off of their products. Yep. Use coupon code FOODHEALS to get 20% off plus free shipping on your purchase at globalhealingcenter.com. You are listening to the Food Hills Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. All right, we're back with Tess, whose passion is to help others enjoy delicious vegan food. Tess knows firsthand how it is possible to be an unhealthy vegan. I know that too. But she is grateful for her struggles because now she's come out on the other side with more knowledge that she loves spreading with the world. So we're going to ask her for some of her tips right now. First of all, Tess, can you tell us about sprouting? Yeah, I get excited about sprouting. And it's easier than ever to eat sprouted foods now because they're available everywhere. The cool thing about sprouting is that whenever you sprout something, you exponentially increase the available nutrients. So whenever you sprout something, it just, you know, I don't even know why this works, but the nutrients become much more available and it just makes things much healthier. It increases the vitamins, it increases the minerals. And so it's, you know, it's something that we can do at home. We can sprout like alfalfa is really nutrient dense and it's really easy to sprout. And so I'll sprout alfalfa, I'll sprout sunflower, things like that. But then, you know, you can even go buy tofu, which tastes just the same. It looks the same. When I first heard the word sprouted tofu, I imagined this really freaky science experiment looking thing. Yeah, right. And just, that's <laughs> what I'm envisioning. Me like, too. like like hair growing out of tofu or something or know, sprout it's hair. so creepy, but it just looks like it just looks like regular tofu. It just looks like normal tofu. It's just made from beans that have been sprouted. So it's it's just oh, better for you. I see. So how yeah. do you sprout, would you say alfalfa? Yeah. How do you do so- it? I like to have, and I recommend anyone just having mason jars on hand because they're such a great thing to have in your kitchen for leftovers and for all kinds of things. So I use a mason jar with a wide mouth lid. I have sprouting lids that I buy and I put in, so let's say you've got a a quart sized mason jar. You're going to want to put in a tablespoon of alfalfa seeds and soak them for several hours and then you pour off the water. And then from there, you're just basically rinsing them morning and night until they become sprouts in the fridge you put them in the fridge or you keep no, them out not until and then when they're done you want to immediately put you know cover them up and put them in the fridge but while you're spreading them you just want to keep them for the most part out of sunlight but then for the last day or the last few hours you want them in the sunlight so that they can develop chlorophyll mm. fantastic <laughs> moving on <laughs> and what's your um biggest tip about ginger Yes. Well, as we all know, well, not all of us, but a lot of us know by now that ginger is amazing as far as being an anti-inflammatory. So it's great for your joints. It's a great immune booster, great for circulation. So it's a wonderful thing to have in your diet. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is that you don't actually have to peel ginger. Mm -hmm. A lot of the nutrient, like a lot of vegetables, you know, so many of the nutrients are located right under the skin. So you can just you know, take a whole chunk of ginger and just grate it up. Yep. Skins and all. Yeah. Yep. And I'll put it in tea too. So I'll just like boil. I won't boil it to too high of heat, but I'll just warm it up. And that makes a really good tea. 
Mm, yum. And one thing I've been doing this week and well, for a long time, but I've been, I've been sort of obsessing about it this week is I've been, you know, putting ginger juice and making soda out of ginger juice and you just put a little liquid stevia and freshly, you know, fresh ginger juice and then some sparkling water. It almost sounds like you're saying gin and juice, which is (laughs) a Snoop Dogg thing. It's not, it's ginger juice. You could probably make some ginger gin and juice too. (laughs) You could. (laughs) Gin and ginger juice. I would drink that. (laughs) Really? That'd be good for my throat. (laughs) All right. And what's the healthiest way to start your day? Well, there's lots of healthy ways to start your day. But, you know, so another throwback to the two-week program that's in my second book is using fresh lemon water in the morning. And so you just juice up some lemon and you can use hot water, cold water, whatever you like. You can even make, if you want something a little fun, you can even make a lemon soda with some liquid stevia and some sparkling water. But that lemon is great because it really makes our system more alkaline. It's detoxifying and cleansing and it just feels really good. Yeah. I try to do lemon water throughout the day. I'll just have a lemon and like cut off a little piece for each new glass of water that I have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lemon's amazing. Yeah. I love it. We get it delivered to the house with our CSA box. So I'm always, I need to give them out because we have so many extra. And the next door, they have a lemon tree, but I think the garden- I used to have a lemon tree in my yard. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes the lemons fall down and I try to grab them, but I'm telling you the gardeners must be taking them because they don't, they're not there anymore. Yeah. And and they grow so big if you just let them. They're amazing. Wow. That's awesome. You know, if you have too many lemons, another thing you can do is just juice them. I have a, an electric, you know, citrus juicer, and then you can freeze, you can put them like, let's say in an ice cube tray, the juice, and then pop out a cube, you know, one cube at a time kind of thing. Right. Yum. All right. And then tell us about the Korean vegetable pancakes. Yeah. So recently I did a kind of like a book tour slash see friends and family thing. And when I was in Michigan, I was at my friend Kim's house and she told me, you know, hey, I want to show you how to make these Korean mung bean pancakes. Mm -hmm. She's Korean. So I'm, you know, I said, oh, that sounds great. And then she said that you make them right from the whole bean. And I'm thinking, that sounds really weird. This is going to be so weird. (laughs) And, you know, I'm thinking like you just blend up beans and make a pan. It just sounded gross to me. But it was like the coolest thing ever because all you do is you soak the mung beans overnight. And she actually uses split hulled mung beans, but I've been doing just regular old mung beans and they work just as well. Mm -hmm. It's just that the, they don't look quite as cool and yellow. They're more of a green, but you soak the beans overnight and then you pour off the water and then you put them in a blender and you just add enough water so that it blends up. You add salt and pepper and then you stir in your vegetables. So we, you know, ideally you can stir in some kimchi, you could stir in some bean sprouts, some shiitake mushrooms, some green onions, some chopped onions, and you just pour it out and pan fry it. Yeah. And they're so, you guys, they're so good. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that just beans and vegetables it made such a good pancake. It's like a freak of nature. That's thing. awesome. Yeah, it's the coolest thing ever. And then you can keep the batter in your fridge and just pour out that, you know, pancakes whenever you want. And I love that they're so clean and healthy, but they're so yummy. I love easy recipes like that that are also delicious. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know, right? It's so easy. All right. And we cannot get off with you today without asking you for that raw cheesecake recipe because I'm still Give thinking it to about us, it. Tess. <laughs> You know what? I actually just this week I put it on my website. Oh, okay. So you yeah, you it's in it's the cover recipe for my, you know, new cookbook, but it's also on my website which is testchalice.com. So you can go to my food blog tab and it'll be right there. The strawberry chocolate cheesecake. And it is it's pretty freaking yummy. And you can eat it for breakfast. It's healthy enough to eat for breakfast. I'm making it tonight. I'm so making that for <laughs> breakfast. I'm making oh it for gosh. dinner. <laughs> tell me what you think. I love it. I, so I love when people tell me when, or you can, you know, put it on Facebook and tag me, but I lo- I'd love to see. Yeah. I'd love to see what you think of it. Okay. Will do. All right, Yay. Tess, tell us about your coaching program. Yeah. So I do two different types of coaching. I have a group that I run, which is called Be Radiant. Mm -hmm. And it's for, it's all women. It's just for women. And it's a way for women to feel supported and to have weekly menus and to have two, there's two program options that they can choose from. 
And it's just a very body positive way for women to lose weight in a healthy and delicious way. So that's an online group that I run. And then I also do one-on-one coaching, Mm -hmm. which allows me to get really, really in depth with a person. And I really approach it from a whole person perspective. So I like to, I like to look at people's beliefs and people's habits and what they eat and how they think and their experiences and their goals. And it's really one of my greatest passions. I love that. So where can everyone find you online and get involved? Testchalice.com. And tell us your social media handles. I pretty much am Test Chalice everywhere. On Facebook, it's Test Chalice. Um, and then there's more. It's Test Chalice Vegan Chow. Oh, God, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> but if something. they Google you, it'll all come up. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you go to my website, you'll be able to connect through to my social media. And spell your last name for us real quick. It's C-H-A-L-L-I-S. Thank you. Perfect. And can you leave us with a tweetable? Yeah. So rediscover how wonderful your life can be inside and out. Beautiful. If you like that, tweet it to Tess at Tess Chalice. Tweet it to us at Food Heals Nation. Use the hashtag Food Heals Podcast so we can see your posts. Tess, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tess. Oh, the pleasure was all mine, ladies. Thank you. Food Heals Nation, don't forget to join our mailing list so you can get all the juicy details when we launch our Food Heals VIP Club. Yep, sign up today and we will email you a discount code that you can use to get 20% off anything in the club. The Food Heals VIP Club is a members-only club and holistic lifestyle brand where we will teach you strategies and classes in the fields of nutrition, spirituality, and entrepreneurship. All our favorite things to talk about. All of our favorite things. (laughs) The Food Heals VIP Club is something we've been working on for a while now, and we've just been putting our hearts and souls into it. It's been really fun and rewarding, and I just can't wait till we launch to bring you all this good stuff. So stay tuned for the launch date, but we are thrilled to bring you classes like How to Do a Juice Cleanse. Or if you are looking to add more vegan meals into your life, we're going to give you the perfect vegan meal plan for ultimate health, longevity, and vitality. Or if you have a health business like we do, we'll teach you the exact strategies we use to get sponsors, how to use affiliate marketing to build your business, how to attract more clients for your coaching business, how to rock the world of social media, and just so much more. And of course, we promise to get a little woo-woo on you and teach you all about energy healing in our manifestation classes and guided meditations, like how to manifest more money or how to release food cravings and even how to attract the one. I think we should get woohoo on them. <laughs> <laughs> so go to foodhealsvip.com. Sign up today. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to change their status update from hashtag blessed to hashtag OMG even more blessed than yesterday, hashtag loving life. If you experience any of these symptoms, make sure to tweet a Kardashian immediately.